kudos to the city for offering this educational uh, opportunity for you, and it's one of my favorite topics to talk about. If you want the long version, the all-day version, go to my website, which is www.cmg.colostate.edu. That is short for Colorado Master Gardener. Colostate. It's Colostate, not ColoradoState.edu. Click on Garden Notes, and then you want Garden Notes numbers 411 through 413. And that's the all-day version of it. And if you want the complete manual, our Colorado Master Gardener manual is now available as a national publication, which we are real excited about, full color uh, from Kendall Hunt Publishing. Uh, the Science of Gardening, that is available. You can get it through off my website. It's also available directly from Kendall Hunt as an ebook now. Uh, so go to the website for more information. One of the first things I want to talk about, uh, and I'm going to pull a lot of kind of disjointed pieces out of this big full day curriculum, is that design and gardening are not the same. They are totally separate disciplines. They do overlap, uh, but gardening is an application of science, and landscape design is an application of art. And as I do uh, the all day class where they have hands on activities, and I, as the instructor, get to walk around, I kind of smile because you say, oh, that person really has some artistic skills and that person was out gardening when God passed out artistic skills because they don't quite get it. And so being a great gardener does not mean you are trained in landscape design and being great in landscape design does not mean that you're trained in gardening because they are separate disciplines that over, overlap. So let's start by reviewing the seven principles of water-wise landscaping. And I always change it from water-wise gardening because these are not gardening principles. These are landscape design principles, the other side of the brain. So let's quickly review them. We start with plan design for water conservation, beauty, and utility. What's the take home message? When I lived in Fort Collins, I had a neighbor across the street who was big on Zurich plants. He was always saying, Come over and see this new plant I got. And he would plunk this Zurich plant with everything else, and he would water it like everything else and he hadn't saved a drop of water. Because it doesn't happen by accident. It has to take place by design. This is a phenomenal garden I came across in Queenstown, New Zealand. Very dry area, and this little garden is an absolutely am amazing oasis. This is a world-class artist who paints the gardens. Um, I even felt like I was really getting extravagant to buy a couple of her postcards, you know? let alone some of her paintings were, were valued at what my house cost, but that's okay. But landscape design, if you're going to save water, it doesn't happen by accident. It takes planning. We talk a lot about selecting plants appropriate for our climate, and that's not the take-home message. It's not just about plant selection. It is about grouping them based on the water needs. So one part of the, of the landscape has plants that require routine irrigation. Another part of the landscape has plants that require less watering, and then we're going to actually water different sections of the yard based on the water needs of those plants, and this is called hydrozoning, and we're going to spend more time talking about that in just a little bit. Watering efficiently with appropriate irrigation methods. This is the trump card when we talk about the seven principles, because it doesn't matter what else you do if you are not efficient in your landscape irrigation, uh, you're going to use a lot of water. I used to have a next, next door neighbor who had their landscape designed by a very renowned landscape architect who specializes in Zurich design. And they were applying three times more water than I was. How do I know? I was over there measuring it. You know, they were complaining on a wet spring that everything was dying. Well, they were putting on so much water on top of the rain that they lost about half of their yard. When we talk about efficient irrigation, you've got to start with a design that is efficient for water delivery. You've got to maintain it to be efficient for water delivery, and then you've got to manage it to be deficient. And those are three totally separate classes that we don't have time to go into tonight. Creating practical turf and non-turf areas. I, I'm amazed how many times I've read popular press that's very anti-turf. You know, and I kind of think that when God created Kentucky bluegrass, he did a great job because it doesn't have to be a water guzzler. And it can go dormant. 
Now, my, we put some Kentucky bluegrass in my dad's garden. He, he had a half an acre, a quarter acre garden. He was in his late 80s. I said, Dad, you don't need a quarter acre of vegetables. You know, uh, your friends are all gone. You know, who, what you can do with all these vegetables? And so we put Kentucky bluegrass, and he had a real hard time letting it go summer dormant. It took a couple of years for him to kind of, okay, maybe that's acceptable. It's very interesting here in the West, we have the mentality the lawn has to be green. And in the East, they have no problem with it letting go a little dormant in the summer. I guess it's because we are so hungry for green because we live in the West. It is about improving the soil. And how does improving the soil play into water savings? If you're on a sandy soil, that improved soil is going to hold more water, like 10 times more water for the volume of soil. If you're on a clayey soil, that improved soil is going to increase the pore space. That's the area for oxygen between the soil grains. With the improved pore space, you're going to have deeper rooting. With deeper rooting, your, your soil will be more efficient in capturing a rain event or capturing an irrigation event. And I've always read about this, but it really hit a couple of years ago when I moved to Severance. New house, the builder had put in the front lawn, so the soil was not improved. I improved the rest of the yard to 5% organic matter, which is the standard. Took a sod cutter, took part of the front lawn, moved it to the back. The back lawn with the improved soil is so easy to care for. It is watered once a week, it is fertilized once a year, and it is for all intents and purposes, as good as a lawn needs to be. And the front yard, which went right on that compact soil with no improvement, is a real challenge. It's watered about every three or four days or it's turning brown. It's very lightly fertilized constantly because of the lack of root penetration goes from an easy maintenance to a hard maintenance uh, based on your soil prep. Mulching to reduce evaporation. Uh, I'm really big on wood chip mulch. When I was with the University of Minnesota before coming to, to CSU, I did a lot of research on wood chip mulch, and I really like it as a, as a mulching potential. And if you go to the local suppliers for wood chip mulch, you have a lot of options uh, based on what you want to pay and what you want it to look like. Uh, but my yard is all mulched, except for my little tiny bit of lawn. I do have a little bit of grass. It takes me five minutes to mow, so it's big, okay? And my water bill changes very little from winter to summer because of the mulch. If you have mulch with drip irrigation, which my entire yard is except for a little bit of lawn, uh, your water use is cut by 50%. Because you're applying the water through the drippers right into the soil, not spraying in the air. And that is amazing for water saving potential. The last one is maintaining with good horticultural practices. And how does this play into landscape design? We use a rule of thumb that 90% of our landscape maintenance problems started with design failures. My biggest challenge, again, is my front lawn where the soil was not improved, and that was a failure in, in design. And I'm really tempted to take a sod cutter, take the front lawn up, improve the soil. That would be a killer of a day, but it would really make my lawn easy to go, so maintain with good horticulture practices. So when we talk about the seven principles of water-wise gardening, they're really not about gardening. They are about how we approach landscape design. And I want to go back and focus on just a few of these and then also give you a few, a few hints on how to kind of create some pizzazz in your yard as you look at it. So what's landscape design? How do most people approach it? We go to the store, we see a plant, we say, oh, that's cool, I'm going to buy it, I take it home. Now, where is it going to fit? Well, let's see, I guess we'll stick it there, right? And that is not design. That is called buy and plunk. And the nurseries, if they're good in marketing, are very good at helping you buy and plunk. Yeah, I was do it, doing my new landscape. I got out to a local nursery, saw this dwarf peach tree with blood red leaves. I says, oh, wow, wouldn't that be amazing? I bought it, I plunked it. It was gorgeous, it winter killed. And I did not replace it for $350. So what is landscape design? Design is much more than buying and plunking. It is a process. And tonight we're just gonna just actually just skim a few pieces of that process. 
Um, and again, if you want the long version of the process, go to the website and look at the garden notes. It is about creating practical and pleasing outdoor living space. And what do I mean by practical? Is practical for me the same as practical for you? Not necessarily. I like to start my day by spending a few minutes in the garden. So I'm out there in the morning and, oh, that's when I'm going to pull a weed or prune the roses. And my neighbor, they don't garden. So what I enjoy out of the garden, what they enjoy out of the garden is not the same. How about changing in your life? Is what's practical today the same thing that's going to be practical in 10 years or 20 years? My dad was an avid gardener. He'd won several awards in the community for his flower beds in his garden. When he turned 90 at Christmas dinner, he said, I've been gardening for 90 years. I think I deserve a break. I'm not going to put my floral displays out anymore. And I thought, yeah, Dad, I bet. And right on cue, the doorbell rang. Someone had left a card at the door. He opened it up, and it said, thank you for your beautiful flowers. When I have a bad day, I drive by your yard, and it always cheers me up. <laughs> and my dad, with a twinkle in his eye, said, oh, crap, i got to keep gardening. <laughs> you know, so what's practical for me and you is not the same, and what's practical for me today may not be the same that is practical for me in 10 or 20 years. How about pleasing? I'll have to admit, uh, landscape design is my favorite topic to teach of all the classes we do for Colorado Master Gardeners because their heads are bobbing like this and their heads are bobbing like this. And how are, how are the students bobbing heads up and down and sideways on the same slide? Because we don't all have the same idea of what is pleasing. And landscape design is an art form. It is about creating what is practical and pleasing for you. Is about how you're going to use the space. This is one of our master gardener homes in, in Fort Collins. Beautiful yard, patio area, small table, under a canopy of trees, a small vegetable garden behind me where I took the picture, flower bed of the night to the side. Great. For me, perfect. My mom would look at that and say, oh, the table only holds six people. The table on her patio holds 30. So how are you going to honestly use the space? That is what landscape design is all about. It is about connecting to the space. And how do you connect to that photograph right there? Notice the path. The path is a landscape design principle called line. We're going to talk about that all night tonight, about how line creates those rooms and invites you to connect to that space. Paradise is a Persian world for walled garden. And when I first read that, I thought, oh, the Persians must have had a really rough lifestyle, you know. They had a wall out, the violent neighbors, and I was totally off base. The Persians started walling their gardens to define it as sacred space. And the concept of sacred space gardening is sweeping the world again, where in landscape design we are again walling the gardens, not to keep the riffraff out, but to define it as sacred space. And I recently read a book that called it re re rejuvenation space. And I really like that term because for me it really is. I love to go out and be rejuvenated, to be healed, to relax, to unwind in the garden. It is amazing the ability of a garden to do emotional and physical healing. It is about connecting to the space. So it's not about the things you put in it. It's about the feelings and the emotions that are created in landscape design. And whenever I talk about the feelings, there's always something about it that says, I don't get at what you mean by feelings. Okay? Moods of uh, garden can make you feel happy or relaxed or energized. What do you want? What do you want to create? That is what design is all about. More than anything else, a garden is a portal, a passage into another world. One of your own thoughts and your own making. It is whatever you want it to be. If I were to take the portal into your landscape, into your garden, what would I find? What do you want me to find? Is it a place of peace and relaxation? Is it a place of energy? Is it a place of activities? Uh, what are, how are you using your landscape? What are the feelings, the moods, the atmosphere that you want to create for that landscape? 
And that is what landscape design is all about. So looking at some, some of the terms, we do not have time tonight to go through all of them. We're just going to pick a few uh, that have direct application to water or direct application to design where I might be able to give you a few hints to go home and kind of add some pizzazz to it. And I'm going to start with unity. Unity is that quality of wetness. It basically says, does the thing come together? And wherever you are looking, I should see unity. And I shouldn't say, oh, wow, look at that amazing flower bed, and the rest of the yard kind of sucks swamp water. Okay? It all comes together as one piece, not as individual pieces. So be very careful in design that it's not, wow, I did a nice job in that one spot. I did nothing in the rest of the yard. Uh, this is um, Hat Hatley Park, Victoria, British Columbia, an amazing spot. Uh, the Dunsmore family who built this were contemporary with the Butchart family. Uh, a good example of unity, how everything comes together. Unity attracts and holds attention and organizes the view into orderly groups and gives you a focal point or piece of emphasis. But whatever you're looking at all comes together as one piece, not individual sections of it. Keep that in mind. So what do you think of that one? This is an illustration, I'd say, where we don't have unity. What's wrong with the white picket fence? It doesn't fit with the style of the house or the style of the landscape. And so here we have a lack of unity. This is one, I've knocked on the door. You know, I'm a bit of a glass cravat, so I see something that catches my eye. I'm not afraid to knock on my door and say, hi, I'm David. Uh, can I take a picture? Tell me about your yard. You meet some interesting people that way. <laughs> And only one person ever told me to get going. <laughs> There's one of my volunteers. And she says, I don't know who you are, and I'm one of your master gardeners. You're looking at my yard. But I've knocked on their door a couple of times, but I, they're never home. Or maybe they don't want to tell me. But I'm not quite sure what the story is here. You know, they got the dinosaur that pulled the pioneers across the plains and then ate them when it got here. <laughs> you know, you don't want to have one thing that, oh my, did you see that? Unity is the whole thing comes together. This is the Auckland Botanic Gardens, uh, the Garden of, Afri of African Art. Amazing how the plant materials come together to create that safari feeling uh, in this particular garden. This is uh, Abkhazi Garden, my all-time favorite garden in Victoria, British Columbia, developed by Prince and uh, Peggy and Nicholas Abkhazi. And it's called the Garden of Love. Their whole objective was to create a place of, of peace and relaxation. I've taken several uh, tours up there, and it's interesting as they start walking around the garden, people start whispering. We never asked them to whisper, but they feel the reverence, they feel the tranquility, they feel the peace, they feel the love in that garden. And you don't want to shout because it distracts from that feeling. So why do you want to create in your landscape? And unity starts with family analysis. Family analysis is basically where you do a, a review of what your family wants and needs about the landscape. And it's not a list of the plant materials or the things you're going to put in it. So how do most of us do a family analysis? We start with a list. Yeah, we got to have some lawns, some trees, and a dog run, and a patio, and some foundation plans, and flowers. And then we go to the garden show and say, wow, y'all barbecue, and a picnic table, and a compost bin, and a gazebo would be cool. And yeah, we got to have bird baths, and ponds, and fall color, and arborvitas. And if you're my freshman class on campus, you have to have a hot tub <laughs> or a swimming pool. That's a requirement for freshmen. And it becomes a list of things. And if you approach landscape design as a list of things, it's not a design. We call that a zoo landscape, a collection of things rather than a design. So instead, approach it with what do you want? What are the three most important elements of your landscape? And it's not that anything's magical about three, it's saying really what's most important to that. And around those three important elements, write a story about how you want to connect to that landscape. So make some hard choices. So write a paragraph or two around the important elements about how you want to connect, how you want to use that landscape. And when you do that, you will be so energized 
you will just absolutely love doing the rest of the landscape and maintenance, and it will create the landscape that you want rather than being a collection of things. So let me go to my own house. My three important elements is my people space. That includes the deck, the pergola, and a little bit of lawn. My lawn is so big it takes five minutes to mow, front and back. My fruits and vegetables and my flowers. So those were my three important elements. How I want to relate, this is my connection to nature. I begin the day in the garden. I end the day in the garden. Come and see me, guess what? You can ring my doorbell, I'll never hear it because I'm not in the house, I'm out in the garden. I don't have to give my address, just drive down the street, you know where I live. Uh, and for me, it's my sacred space. It is my escape from the pressures of the world. It is my re restorative space. And wow, the ability again of a garden to create healing from physical pain, from emotional pain, from stress is absolutely amazing. And so my storyline is called Morning Sunrise, and it is about a sensory garden. So it brings in the taste of the fruits and vegetables. It brings in the sight. I have a beautiful view of Long's Peak, and I was very careful to capitalize on that and to shade a, a west-facing window but not block that view. The smell, I very carefully put plants in spots where I will have the smell. I have a little dog who loves to run through the Russian sage and then jump on my lap. And I say, mmm, you smell good, you know? That very sagey smell from her. The sound of the birds, the water features that are in the garden, and the touch. And I put plants in just to touch. I put plants in for me to touch because I like to prune. And I put plants in that people can't resist touching just so I can smile on the inside is they have to feel those fuzzy leaves. So my, my garden storyline for my own house is morning sunrise and it's all about a sensory garden. So here's the, here's the backyard before I started. Here's the uh, compost uh, coming in. Here's the pergola being built. Here's the pergola after it was built. That's where you're gonna find me. That's where I basically live in the summertime. Uh, the dry riverbed garden on the side of the house. Uh, other plant materials, the front yard, again, morning sunrise, I try to pick the colors that I find in the morning sun. Sunrise is the colors that I have used in my landscape. And that's how you bring unity into the design, is it starts with that family analysis about how you want to create and relate to and use that landscape. If you don't have a family analysis, it is very challenging to do because it takes some internal evaluation of what you really want, and it is really, really fun to do. We transform our gardens into sacred space when we understand them as a place of growth, not only for plants, but also for our inner self. And again, this concept of sacred space is worldwide, and it is totally revolutionizing the whole approach to landscape design. Putting more emphasis on creating the moods and feelings rather than a collection of plants or a collection of things in landscape design. So write a storyline around the important elements about how you want to relate to the garden. It creates that very congruent message. It sets the direction of where you're going to go for that unity, and it's going to reflect your personal taste. And it is really fun to do as you really say, what do I want? How am I going to relate to? that landscape rather than just being a collection of things in the design. So let's move on and talk about a few of the other terms in the, in the short time that we have. A landscape design is primarily based on the concept of line. Line is where you basically uh, connect the elements. It is, defines the rooms. Landscape design theory is basically creating a series of outdoor rooms. Just like in the house you have different rooms that have different functions. You have different rooms in the landscape that would have different functions or different uses. And line is what connects. And the big take-home message on line is you want bold lines, not little zigzags. You weren't drunk when you drew the line. Remember that. It is very bold lines that you want to work with. So this is Lauren at Castle Dunedin, and I'm doing a trip to, to New Zealand uh, next February. If anybody wants to come along, we're going to spend three nights here. 
this is an amazing place to wake up, and that's your garden to, to stroll in the morning before breakfast. Uh, the, the fog was just rolling out. We're on a peninsula out on the ocean. Amazing perennial border there. And notice the line, that very bold path, is how you are invited and connected to it. Uh, this is at Chicago Botanic Gardens. This is an Italian-style design where you have a line within a line within a line. Very popular in landscape design styles is lines within lines within lines. Keep that in mind as a professional trick as you put your lines on paper. Uh, Butch Art Gardens, again, amazing the lines that they have created and the boxes and, and thresholds that you go through as a way of inviting you to explore the garden. Uh, this is a private garden, Sir Warren Miles in Christchurch, New Zealand. He is a renowned uh, architect. And Jeff and I, who is my consultant on this curriculum, have, have said this is the most amazing garden we have ever seen as far as his understanding of the use of line. We wish every class we ever taught would have the chance to go there because he is so powerful in the use of line. Uh, another one, Th this was a perennial border that's all done in blues and purples and silvers, which is the colors that I like because of the peace, the tranquility, the, the, the regal that it brings into it. Oh, wow, this is just absolutely breathtaking of this very long perennial border. And again, it is the line that invites you to it. So again, you want very strong, bold lines in your design. Uh, Kuchenhof, uh, seven million bulbs in bloom, all done in lines. And every year, Kuchenhof takes everything out and starts over. This is a bucket list place to visit if you like spring bulbs. Uh, Gasbeck Castle in the Netherlands, another different style, but a very popular use of line. And again, coming back from the Italian style, where you have a line within line within line in a more formal type of design. Uh, this is a, what we call a Tuscan style. This is a, an adaptation of the Italian where we don't have as straight of lines. They're more curvy. And this is an award winner in Colorado Landscape Design Competition a couple of years ago. But again, very strong, bold lines is the uh, real important take home message. So we're gonna start putting lines on papers. We're gonna start doing what we call hydrozone bubble drawing. So I'm gonna show you a few bubble drawings for this fictitious house. So again, we said my, my, my important elements was my people space. That would be the patio of the lawn in this one, the vegetables, the flowers. So there are some bubbles. And what you're doing with bubble drawings is you're basically playing with how much space does the lawn take? How much space does the vegetable garden take? And it doesn't mean that the vegetable garden's a round bubble, that you're just kind of playing with space allocation. So there's one way to look at it. Here's another way to look at it. Here's another way to look at it. And you just keep drawing bubbles and moving things around until you find a design that kind of really comes alive about how you're going to connect to and use that space. Here's an example where I eliminate the lawn, a little bit larger patio surrounded by, by the flowers. So bubble drawings are where we actually begin to walk the talk of being water-wise, where we're going to start talking about that concept of hydrozoning, of how we're going to connect the spaces. So hydrozoning, again, is where we're going to group plants based on their water needs, and then actually water various parts of the yard differently based on the water needs. And is that different than the old standard landscape design, where the entire yard has the same irrigation? If we're going to walk the talk of being water-wise, the entire yard does not receive the same amount of irrigation. You have different zones, hydrozones, that are going to be controlled and irrigated separate based on the actual plants that you are going to put in there. So you could have hydrozones that are routinely irrigated. You're going to have hydrozones that have reduced irrigation, maybe watered like once a week or every 10 days. Um, they may have hydrozones that are only watered during prolonged dry spells, and you could have hydrozones that are never irrigated. And I've kind of just generally said, here's four examples of different hydrozones, but there's no black and white areas. There are just various levels of irrigation that they're going to receive. So lawn, where does lawn fit? 
if you are a turf that is being used as a ball field and so it's constantly having to repair damage, it better have routine irrigation or it's not going to repair the damage. How many of your home lawns have that type of damage? One, I know he's got kids. Two, I can see you got kids. Most of us don't. Most of us grossly overwater our lawn. And reduced irrigation, it keeps it just on the edge of green, can cut your water use 20, 30, 40 percent. In fact, the rule of thumb is reduced irrigation where you really manage your lawn well, cut your water use by 50 percent compared to the typical, I don't really care how much water I put on. Minimal irrigation, that summer dormant bluegrass lawn, is actually the lowest of all the lawn choices that we typically find in Colorado. If we looked at mixed flower and shrub beds, again, you could have some plants that have routine irrigation, some plants that have reduced, some plants that have limited. I suspect many of you have been on, on a, at Perk, uh, where, we're, where the new football stadium goes, and we're losing that research facility there, where we're doing research on various landscape plants, and you can see them where they got lots of water and little bits of water. It's very interesting how some years they look, the ones that get a little bit of water look pretty good. And other years, the stuff that got medium amount of water looks pretty burned up. How come it changes around so much? Some years it rains a lot, and some years it doesn't. So it's not easily black and white. If you're talking vegetables, they are routinely irrigated, or guess what? You don't want to eat them. If you're talking uh, fruit trees, they don't want that routine irrigation. They want it to be reduced because they're very prone to phytophthora root rot. If you're talking small fruit, strawberries, raspberries, they're kind of in the middle. Typically shallow rooted and intolerant of getting dry, but not a heavy water use. If you're looking at non-irrigated areas, that side yard on the typical residential subdivision that has no function would be a great as a non-irrigated. Now my side yard is definitely a garden, but the typical side yard that is not used other than simply space between the house and the property line would be a great non-irrigated hydrosome. So we have a lot of options, and again, the point is the entire yard is not irrigated the same. We have different hydrozones, and different parts of the yard will receive different amounts of irrigation. So let's go back to these bubble drawings and talk about where we could be. So the lawn, we're going to say, is reduced irrigated water just enough to keep that bluegrass green. And bluegrass is amazing. If you let it dry just a little bit, there's a time when it just kind of slows the growth before it goes brown and you don't have to mow as much. If you can let it dry just a touch, it's amazing. Flower beds, maybe it's reduced, or maybe we could divide the flowers area into a routine irrigated for those species that want and require the routine irrigation. And maybe there's another part of the flower bed that is a reduced irrigated for those plants that don't need that heavy irrigation. And maybe there's a third part of that flower bed that is limited irrigated there would only be water during prolonged dry spells. And again, this is where we're, we're walking the talk of hydrozone bubble drawings. And when you walk the talk, it is bubbles. It really is just a circle. And then we're going to refine that as we move on. So here might be a large flower bed with reduced. I actually don't have any flowers in my yard that are, that are routine. I took them all out. Uh, it's all reduced or limited. And maybe that splits into a reduced and a limited. And wow, the potential to save water is huge when you go back to the design concept of hydrozone bubbles and are recognizing different sections of the yard will receive different amounts of irrigation. So lots of options about how you could draw those bubbles. Uh, when I was working on my yard, I must have done 50 of them as I kept moving things around and playing with things until I finally decided space allocations and where the various beds were and the amount of water that they would be. Uh, and you can really have a good time moving things around and playing with that. This is not a hydrozone bubble because what's wrong with all the red space? Not sure what it is. So when you do hydrozone bubbles, looking at your irrigation potentials, it fills the entire space. 
And this is not a hydrosome bubble because hydrosome bubbles don't, don't actually define the paths and the walkways and shapes of beds. We're going to get to that down the road, but that comes after you actually do the bubble drawings, and they can be fun to do. So go back and, and hydrozone your yard. Even if you have an existing landscape, is your landscape going to change over time? Go back and, and start with those bubble drawings on paper, your first lines, and start hydrozoning the yard so that it can evolve into a more efficient landscape design. And after we got the hydrozone bubbles, then we're going to go into our design styles. And this is where they've taken the, the hydrozone bubble on the left and put it into a rectilinear style. The rectilinear style has straight lines and right angles in squares and rectangles. And it could be described as organized and stately, or stale and stiff, depending on your perception of this, these design styles. People have a love-hate relationship with the design styles. This is the same bubble drawing that went into a curvilinear. In curvilinear, you eliminate the straight lines. They all become curves. And again, it is bold sweeping curves, not little wavy zigzags. Because bold sweeping curves bring your attention. Wavy zigzags say it was an amateur that had too many beers when they drew the line. Keep that in mind. And how would you describe this? more relaxing, free-flowing, more natural, not quite sure what they were doing, kind of disorganized. People have a love-hate relationship with these styles. This isn't what we call an angular design style. Uh, we're going again back to straight lines, but not necessarily right angles and squares and rectangles. It's very interesting. My generation generally hates them, and 70% of my, of my freshman class when they do a landscape design project will do angular. And it is described as being modern, energized, totally chaotic. And people have a love-hate relationship. So you choose one of those styles, rectilinear, curvilinear, or angular, based on the moods and feelings that you want to create for your landscape based on your storyline. So again, it goes back to that storyline about what you want to create. And then you go into one of those styles. A common question is, can you mix them? And we strongly advise that you, that you do not mix the three styles in a given area. Now, I recognize that my yard is curvilinear, my pergola is rectilinear, my carpenter skills weren't quite there to make it roundish, and I live with that. I also recognize it did weaken the feel of the curvilinear. So in design, you want to select one distinct style and stick with it as much as you can. Um, now, you could have one style in the front yard, different style in the backyard. That would be fine. But avoid mixing the styles in any one place. So let's quickly look at just some different styles. Again, a rectilinear. Some people love it. Some people dislike it. Most of us have a love-hate relationship. This is a curling that I personally really like because of the various spaces that it creates as you work with that. I, uh, angular style, higher energy. Put this up on one day in class and a kid in the back of the room says, uh, bring out the, the brats and the kager. He thought he was being a smart aleck. I says, oh, thank you for the paid announcement. You know, this is an action where that is a more of a relaxation. So that's my yard. This would be more like my neighbor's. She loves the energy that her yard brings. I like the peace and tranquility that my yard brings. So what do you want? It's not that there's a right and wrong. It's what do you want? You create the lines, the styles to create the moods, the feelings that you want as you create that landscape that truly reflects you. If you have, if your storyline is about connecting to nature, Mother Nature plants in a kidney shaped. So add kidney shapes as your primary shape, and that will connect you very effectively to a, a natural nature feeling. So again, a lot of options that you can play with based on the energy, the relaxation, the organization, the comfort that you want. And again, it's not a black and white right or wrong. It's what works for you and the storyline that you want to create. 
Uh, so lines basically connect the rooms. They define the rooms. They are what connects you to it. So you want very strong, bold lines in your design. This is the Butch Art Gardens. One and a half million people go through here every summer. I'll be there in a, in a couple of weeks. I've got to go up and look at some tree problems for them. And notice the main, main line going through. The path. So we have primary lines and then we have secondary lines that create and invite you to view that space. Uh, again, uh, Sir Warren Miles' garden looking down from a tower he'd built it at. Uh, amazing use of line in creating and defining space. Again, Kuchenhof, um, 83 acres of bulbs, just all in lines. Moving on to sequence. This is a design principle that I think a lot of homeowners totally have never heard about. And if you are doing the buy and plunk method of landscape design, guess what? It doesn't work for you because it takes a little bit more planning. Sequence is the change in the form, the color, the texture as you move from plant to plant. If you get it right, the garden is alive. If you get it wrong, it is just sitting there. When I was a student at Utah State University, I worked for the Salt Lake Extension Office one summer, and one day they sent me to the research gardens to help Dr. Ryman plant a petunia bed. The bed was probably about the fourth the size of this room. And he said, do you see what I'm doing? Yes, you're planting petunias. Well, you start on the north side, I'll start on the south side, we'll meet in the middle. In the middle. And when we got done, I looked down and says, oh crap, I don't know what I did, but it just didn't work. And all summer long, my job was to answer the phones in the Salt Lake Extension Office, and it was, I was just up to Far Wayne your Research Gardens, and my petunias have the same disease that, that you have on the north side of the bed. Uh, my petunias have the same insect. I did not understand sequence. Dr. Ryman did not explain that to me. Sequence is how you move from plant to plant. I'll give you the trick he forgot to tell me that was obvious from the minute it got planted through the entire summer in just a bit. So looking at sequencing texture. Texture is, is it a fine, is it light, is it coarse, it is heavy. And texture gardening has become one of the big trends. We're seeing a trend to go away from color and more into texture. Why is the trend to go away from color? Color is only there in the summer. And one of the big trends is more designed to add a pill 12 months of the year. And 12 months of the year is about texture. So when you're looking at texture, texture naturally gets finer as you go away. And so you put the finer texture in the back corner and you put the coarser textures towards you. That's a trick in sequencing. Finer textures go in the back corner, coarser textures are going to be closer. What if you went just the reverse? You'll say it doesn't work and you don't know why. Because texture naturally gets finer as you go into the corner. If, you are, if you've ever been to a Japanese garden, uh, it's all about textures, and one of my favorites, is, again, is Butch Art Gardens. Uh, their texture garden in, in the Japanese garden is absolutely amazing on how you basically play with textures. The big thing with textures is you go to the finer texture plants. You want to use more of the finer textures. So if you had one of the coarse texture, maybe you'd have three to five of the next finer texture, and maybe uh, six to uh, 11 of the next going out. So be very careful about using too many, of course, textured. And the big thing on textures is the plant side by side, leaf size has to change by at least a half. So do not put two different plants side by side whose leaves are about the same size. And yesterday I did some planting in the garden. I had some uh, gay feather that had, fro that had, had winter killed. I replaced a couple of them with some lavender to make a little bit of change. So I stuck and I thought, oh my goodness, the lavender and the gay feather, the leaf is almost identical. And guess what? I know I'll be ripping it out. Do not put two plants side by side that are different that have the same leaf size. It doesn't work. That's one of the tricks of adding pizzazz to your landscape. And you'll know you have texture correct. Take a picture of the garden, flip it into grayscale. If you can still see the definition that it's, the textures are correct, 
If you lose the definition, it says your texture combinations was weak. So the big thing with texture is you are pairing coarser textures and finer textures. Another thing is you're looking with texture sequence. If you're working with a, a flower bed, the trump piece of this flower bed is the inside curve. And I'm going to take the coarse texture, which is a black dot, and that's going to go opposite the inside curve. And then I'm going to come out with the next size of leaf, a little finer texture, and they're going to be in a, generally in a kidney shape, somehow coming off that coarser texture. And then I'm going to add that third texture coming out, again, in a kidney shape, typically. And then I'm going to fill in with the finest texture. And the finest texture goes on the inside curve, and the coarse texture goes opposite. How come? Go up the pooter. Look at how Mother Nature landscapes. The sandbar is on the inside curve, and the rock cliff is opposite. So the fine texture is inside curve, coarse texture opposite that. And again, the big thing with texture is you want to marry fine textures with coarse textures. So here at the Japanese garden, again, the fine texture of the moss married with the coarse texture of the, of the tree trunks and the lantern just create magic as you're working with that. So coarse textures married with fine textures. You want, again, at least leaf size changing at least a half as you put plants side by side. And if we're talking about winter gardening, it's all about texture gardening. And so we use the two terms, winter gardening and texture gardening, interchangeable. Moving on to color. This is an interesting one. It's clearly the trump uh, as far as landscape design principles. We talk of color, that there are three things that interplay about who is dominant and who is subordinate. It could be the hue, that is, is it a red, is it an orange, is it a yellow, a blue, or a green? It could be the value, and that is, is it a light blue or a dark blue? And which would be more do dominant, a light blue or a dark blue? The dark. And then intensity, the red, red versus the red orange. And which would trump out of that, which would be more dominant? The pure color. They are very powerful in how they emote fe feelings and emotions. They are very closely related to scale. And it's not about mixing all the colors of the rainbow. It is about, again, creating the moods and feelings that you want in the landscape. So what colors do you want in your landscape? What moods and feelings do you want to create? Uh, the cool colors, your, your violets, your blues, your greens are less conspicuous, they're restful, they suggest distance, they're low scale, they're low energy, they are relaxing. My yard is primarily in the cool colors because my objective is, is that peace, that tranquility. My neighbor loves red. Her entire house on the inside is painted in various shades of red. Every plant in the yard is red leafed or red flowered except the lawn. And she did actually ask if there was a red color of, red color of grass or if she could dye it. Because for her, she loves the energy that comes from red. And it's not there's a right and wrong. It's what is the mood you're trying to create that comes from your storyline? So how does color speak to you? As I, as I flip up these colors, think to yourself, what do they say to you? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some terminology that came out of a popular col color therapy book, but it's not what the book says. It's what does the color communicate to you. So what does red say? Again, my neighbor loves red. She says, I've got to have red around me. I love the energy that she gets from the red. Red is described as passion, courage, power, wealth, uh, motivation, fame, and love. Are those the terminologies that you want to describe your yard? If yes, then put red. If no, avoid the red. And red is, is a trump color, very powerful in saying, look at me, I'm very important. How about yellow? Yellow is one of our most popular colors in landscape design. Uh, joy, happiness, communications, inspiration, sunshine, focus, and optimism. Uh, does those terms describe the feelings you want to create in your, in your yard? 
If yes, then put in yellow. If no, then that's not the color for you. And again, it's not what the book says. It's what are the terms that actually works in your mind for that. So yellow, very popular in, land, in landscape design. Um, probably the most common color as far as flowers in landscape design. Blue, oh, this is amazing, the ability to create peace and tranquility. Imagination, calm, serenity, relaxation, compassion, reflection. A very peaceful, very calming. A few years ago, I did the entire backyard in monochrome blue, so it was all in light blues and dark blues. It was an interesting year. We had nonstop company. Friends would call and say, ah, oh, we just had a cake come out of the oven, thought we'd come over and share it with you. Uh, do you have ice cream or should we stop and get some? <laughs> Another friend would call and say, ah, oh, I just made a great big bowl of potato salad. We got hamburgers, thought we'd come over and have supper with you. And they would stay and they would stay and I'd be tired because I'm a morning person, not a night person. I'd be looking at my watch and yawning and saying, oh my goodness, I've got an early meeting in the morning. They'd say, yeah, we ought to go home, but it's just so peaceful here. Blue is extremely powerful for the human mind in creating that peace and that tranquility. So it may be a good color for your landscape or it may be the wrong color for your landscape based on the moods and feelings that you are trying to create. My pergola, my people space, is my blue room. And a couple of years ago, I bought and plunked a purple plant. And I put it in, I looked at it for about two days, and I said, mm, it totally changed. Blue and purple, not on the same page. So it got moved. Because it changed the feeling of my blue room. Very, very powerful, again, in creating that peace and that tranquility. How about green? This is the neutral color in the landscape. Harmony, beginnings, prosperity, nature, growth, and healing. Tremendous ability for green to provide emotional healing, physical healing. It's very well documented. Uh, the research on color therapy says wherever, whatever you do when you have a bad day should have some green in it. So if you sit in the bathtub after a bad day, have a green shower curtain. If you have a particular chair that you go to after a bad day, have a green wall opposite. And I just go outside. That's where I find the green that is so amazingly healing in the human mind. Orange, this is an interesting one. Most people have a love-hate relationship with it. You either love it or you hate it. Uh, enthusiasm, joy, exuberance, interaction, fun, captivation, and sex. Let's not confuse sex with love. Love is red, sex is, is orange. Uh, yeah, interesting again the color therapy and what, what these colors say to you. And again, most people love, have a love-hate relationship. This is the color that does not sell well in the nursery. Thousands of daylilies out there. Daylilies started orange, and they're breeding the orange out because most of us don't like it. Uh, purple, very different and quite subtly different than blue as far as what it brings. Devotion, respect, peace, spirituality, awareness, deity, and royalty. Through all generations of humankind, purple has been the color of deity and royalty, which I find very, very interesting. And again, when I plunk that purple plant in, in my blue room, it totally changed the feeling of the blue room. How about white? Uh, purity, innocence, faith, benevolence, honesty, and grace. And the big thing about white is it is not a team player. White always dominates. White says, look at me, I'm very important. And so it doesn't necessarily fit in well with other plants, so use it very careful. In the landscape, white is not neutral. And white gardens are often called night gardens, because the whites and the silvers and the gray come alive in the moon, and what happens to the blues and the reds and the oranges? They go to sleep at night, so a white garden and night garden uh, are often used interchangeable. How about pink? Love, sweetness, uplift, happiness, uh, tenderness, enticement. It's interesting about pink. This is the one color that we clearly have no agreement in our society about what it means. Um, most people have a love-hate relationship with it. 
And a lot of people may have a love-hate relationship with even different shades of pink. Uh, Jeff DeYoung, our consultant on this curriculum, uh, did a, a garden for one of Calgary, Canada's government leaders, and the instructions was monochrome pink, which means various shades of pink. When he got home, he said, wow, this is the most amazing garden he had ever designed. The energy was just phenomenal, and she loved to entertain politicians, and so it was quite the garden. The phone was flashing, and as she picked up the message, she said, I want pink, not salmon. In the monochrome garden, it's various shades of pink. In Jeff's mind, salmon was a shade of pink, not in her mind. He thought, oh, no big deal, I'll just go take the salmon plants out, I'll use them in another, another design and substitute them. He got back, they'd already been pulled out and ripped apart, put on the driveway with a note that salmon makes me vomit. <laughs> now here's a person who wanted a monochrome pink garden, but didn't want salmon. So one color that we do not have an agreement about what, what it means. So the take-home message on this is it's not about putting all the colors of the rainbow in. Don't go out and say, well, let's see, I don't have a yellow one, so let's buy a yellow one. Oh, I don't have a red one, i got to buy a red one. It is about putting the colors in that creates the moods and the feelings that you want in your various rooms. So I have a blue room, and I have a white room, which is my night garden. And I have different rooms with different colors that creates various moods and feelings that match the activity of that room. And watch the scale. More is not necessarily better. You can uh, put so much color in that it actually begins to detract from each other as you're working with that. As a rule of thumb, 90% green will set off 10% color. Uh, as we're looking at sequencing color, how to mix colors, uh, the darkest shade or the purest intensity, that would be the red-red, dominates over the uh, red-orange. And that is typically used at the focal point. Warm colors work best in a sequence. Cool colors work best in a color contrast. And let's look at, at both of these. A color sequence, you're going to start by saying, what colors am I going to use in that sequence? And I'm going to use orange to orange-yellow to a yellow-orange to a yellow. So I'm sequencing from orange to yellow. Which color will naturally dominate? The orange-orange, and so that would be used at the focal point. And then you say, how much of that color do I want? And then as I go to the next shade out, I add one-third more. And the next shade out, one-third more. And the next shade out, one-third more. And notice that's the trick of looking professional. And it's not one-fourth, one-fourth, one-fourth. It is one-third more, one-third more, one-third more. This gives you dominance versus subordination. And, I, and I, I've been a nursery manager. I, I go into the nurseries and watch people, and they get, you know, four of these and four of those and four of those and four of those. It's not a fourth and a fourth and a fourth and a fourth. It's one-third more, one-third more, one-third more to give you that professional touch. And then as you put them in, again, I'm going to start with that dominant color, typically in a kidney or crescent shape. Where does a kidney or crescent shape come from? Mother Nature. So there's my dominant color, and then the second color goes in in a kidney or crescent shape, connecting some way, and it doesn't matter how it connects to it, and then I add the third color, and then I'm going to fill in with the fourth. And this is what Dr. Ryman did not tell me the day I was planting petunias. I thought he was putting the colors in random. He was not. He had a little, a little crescent of one color, and a little crescent of another color, and it was a random interlocking of these crescents, but they were all in crescent shapes. His looked like they were alive, mine looked like they had insects or diseases from day one that lasted the entire year. So interlocking kidney crescent shapes give you that sequence that gives that professional touch, that pizzazz. If you are working with monochrome, or with, with cool season colors, um, like blue, it would be one-third, two-thirds. So one-third light blue, two-thirds dark blue are just the reverse. And note, it is not half and half. Because the one-third, two-thirds gives you dominance and subordination, which is 
an important landscape design principle. If you're working with complementary colors, again, it is one-third, two-thirds, not half and half. And be very careful with complementary colors. The energy from that is very, very high, uh, and it would, would only be appropriate if you need the high energy. So it doesn't work in my yard. Okay. Uh, simplicity variety. This is another uh, principle of landscape design I think a lot of people haven't heard about. And this is where we're going to get away from being that horticultural zoo. And the two terms go together. Simplicity is a, is a degree of repetition rather than constant change. And variety is diversity in color, in texture, in form to prevent monotony. So we start with that fence line. That gives us nice simplicity. And then we add a row of plants in front of the fence line. And that row of plants repeats the line. And so we still have nice simplicity, but no variety because we simply have a line and a second line. Instead, we have the fence that gives us simplicity and a grouping of plants that add the variety. So we are not repeating necessarily that line. Uh, Abkhazi garden, what here gives me the simplicity? What's my repeat element? The heather. And the rest of this garden is actually amazing with what she has there. Uh, Abkhazi garden is an uh, acre and a half. It is 75% rock outcropping. And yet she knew how to work with rock. And it is that heather that connects all the plants. So something has to repeat enough to pull everything else together. This is Colorado Springs Zurich demonstration garden. The, the gray thyme is the repeat element, and the other steppables are the variety. So something dominates and repeats, and the other colors add variety. Again, Colorado Springs Zurich demonstration garden. This is truly a uh, zoo garden in that it is a collection of plants, but it works from the design because the wall here becomes a repeat element that pulls that all together. So wherever you look in that design, I want to see something that is repeated enough that it begins to pull that together. Avoid zipper plantings. Okay, that's the red, the red petunia, the white petunia, the red petunia, the white petunia. The, my neighbors, red rose, pink rose, red rose, pink rose, red rose, pink rose. What's wrong with zipper plantings? They're, they're, they're monotony. There is no simplicity because of the constant change, and there is no variety because it's the same pattern over again. So avoid zipper plantings. This is a zipper plantings in Victoria, British Columbia. Um, Jeff and I sat there for three hours watching people one night. Uh, this particular bed's about three times the length of this room, and it's the same pattern all the way through. And people would be strolling through the park, and as they got to the end of the bed, they'd be all but running. You know, it didn't attract people. People were taking photographs of the flower beds all night long because the, the park in Victoria is quite well known for the flowers. I'm the only one who took a picture of the zipper. And I took it for illustration, for class. Um, a lot of people in the park having picnic lunches and sitting there playing with the kids or reading a book or listening to music or whatever. And beautiful lawn in front of the zipper and not a single person sat there. But they'd sit over there on the lawn covered with geese poop. So it's not the same pattern repeating over and over again. Okay? So simplicity, you're going to add something that becomes the repeat element, and then you're going to add something else that is not quite as big a clusters, and then you're going to add some smaller clusters, and then you're going to plunk in some odds and ends. But avoid creating that horticultural zoo. Something that repeats and something fills in for variety. And where you begin and end things, the rule of thumb is one-third, two-thirds, and avoid putting things smack dab in the center. Because in Western landscape, we don't typically center anything. Okay, emphasis. Um, simply recognizing dominance and subordination in landscape design. So here are some examples of where emphasis has been added. Emphasis comes in color, form, size, and simply adding something unusual. People often talk about the focal point. I don't like the term focal point. I think that misleads people that, wow, did you see that one thing? 
Emphasis is about domination and subordination. So here's some balance and emphasis. I think the top one's a fair, fairly good illustration. Second one, a little bit weak. Not quite sure what, who's dominant and who's subordinate. The mind basically scans the landscape. Most of it scan it clockwise. We, if we see dominance and subordination, we are pulled into it. If we don't see dominance and subordination, we scan it again. If we don't find it the second time, we scan it the third time. After the third scan, we basically pull away from the landscape. So that dominance and subordination, we want to see that there are more important elements and less important. Second one, I'm not quite sure who's number one. Bottom line drawing here, not quite sure who's one. So you want dominance and subordination. What's dominant here? The lantern, and this is a symbol in Japanese gardens that this is sacred space. As you enter, leave your cares and worries behind, or please stay out. That's what that symbol, that's what that lantern means. Dominance and subordination here. This is a hosta bed about three times the size of this room, and they had added dominance by putting some in pots and clusters where the rest were in the ground. And it was amazing, the, the design here. This is one, oh, I always laugh whenever I see it. Uh, the lady had entered a beautification contest sponsored by Extension and a local newspaper. And as we got there, the judges said, wow, we don't even know how to score this. The yard was meticulous as far as maintenance, uh, but there were too many number ones. Uh, the fishing boy says, I'm in the center, I'm number one. No, the white swans with the plastic flowers, cool. Uh, says, I'm white, I'm number one. The blue pond says, no, look at me, I'm number one. The red bridge says, no, I'm number one. No, the lantern says, I'm supposed to be number one. You want a one, a two, and a three, not a one, a one, and a one. We counted 50 number ones in that yard, and it was about the size of this room. The next year, the lady had re-entered the contest. As the judges were going around, my job was to drive the judges. The husband came up and said, David, I really need your help. I can't afford this. She had added 50 more number ones. Forty of them were plastic swans with plastic flowers in them. They must have been on sale at Sears. Okay, you want a one, a two, and a three, not a one, a one, and a one. So another example of too many number ones. The flag says I'm number one salute. The planters on the side of the porch are called sentries, are guard plants. They say we're number one. No, the white pot says, no, I'm white, I'm number one. The white bird says, no, I'm white, I'm number one. You want a one, a two, and a three. If you have a friend, ask them to look at your yard because people often are too married to all the number ones. You want a one, a two, and a three. Now this one, there's a number one, but there's no number two. So a one, a two, and a three. You want to see dominance and subordination as you work with that. Let me end with just a few more slides on uh, a really effective way to create effective plant combinations. And that is, as you put one plant in, you got to say, who is it married to? And you marry it with its opposite. And when you do that, wow, your garden comes alive. So you're going to marry the coarse texture with the fine texture. You're going to marry an upright with a, with a rounded, a small with a large, a short with a tall. And be careful that you don't just very neatly step the landscape down. Some, some variations in height, some things that are partially hidden behind adds interest and intrigue. So let me just end with some slides showing opposites that have been married. Uh, this is very classic. This is Butch Art Gardens in Victoria, British Columbia. Again, Butch Art is this, is, this is their trademark, where they have married the spike with a roundy flower. And again, it's not half and half, it's one-third, two-thirds. And it doesn't matter which is one-third, two-thirds, but it's one-third, two-thirds, not half and half. Here they've married, again, spike with a rounded flower. I won a national award for this photograph. This is poppy with actual wheat. And this variety of wheat turns blood red in the fall. It's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. So you are marrying opposites. As you buy a plant, you say, who is its partner? 
Its partner needs to be something that is distinctly different. And that's how you add that pizzazz to your landscape. Aquam Botanic Gardens, uh, gazania daisies in a bed about the size of this room uh, with the thug uh, strategically placed with it. So marry it with its opposite. As you buy a plant, who is the partner? It needs to look distinctly different. This is called color echoing, where you take the minor color in one flower and it becomes the major color in the other plant. And it is one third, two thirds, not again half and half. And wow, this, this is just breathtaking when you play that color echo game as you are working with it. So pair opposite. Don't over sweat who's by who as long as it's being married with something that is different. Jeff Shard again. Up, down. Coarse with fine. So take home messages. Landscape design is a process. It is more than plunking down. And how does this apply to someone who has an existing yard? Let the process guide the evolution of your yard so it will become the yard that you dream that it will be. It is about creating practical and pleasing outdoor space. And we all have a different view of what practical and pleasing is, and that is a moving target. It is about how you are going to use the space. And you've got to really be honest with yourself about this. My neighbor spent an entire week putting in a phenomenal stone patio that he's never sat on in three years. So how are you honestly really going to use the space? That may take a little soul searching about what you're doing. It is about the moods and the connection that you want from that space. And again, it may take some soul searching to clearly define what it is that you want. It is about hydrozoning, that different parts of the yard have different water needs. And we go back to the hydrozone bubble stage to define those hydrozones. It is about pairing opposites. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Uh, when I was with the University of Minnesota, I did a, a lot of research. In fact, basically funded my position by research on mulch. And I became very anti-landscape fabric because it does not enrich the soil. Uh, you don't get that soil enrichment, which is so essential for good health. Um, and I had a TV show at the time with KSTP Television in and uh, my producer would, would pick two uh, letters each week from the mailbag and we'd go out on site and diagnose what was wrong with the yard. And halfway through the summer she said, David, this is not working. You diagnose everything as the same problem. Rock mulch and landscape fabric. Yeah. Rock mulch and landscape fabric just do not enrich the soils to give us the plant health and vigor that we need. I'm very much against landscape fabric. So why do people put landscape fabric down? Control the weeds. Put newsprint down, two sheets thick, that's all. That will stop any weed seed germination. Put your mulch on top and put the mulch thicker and you'll get that weed control and improve the soil. Uh, thick turf, the question was how, how, do, you, how do you control uh, the dandelions without chemicals? And the big thing with, with uh, lawn weed control is a thick turf. So things to get a thick turf. Fall fertilization, not spring, because fall fertilization puts the growth into a root system. Spring, spring fertilization puts it into leaf that you get to mow off. Aerate the soil so that you have higher levels of soil oxygen. And monitor your irrigation. Uh, that overwatering or that uh, watering and then letting it burn and then watering and letting it burn is going to thin. So if you're going to go dormant, let it go dormant or water enough to keep it just on the green side. So it's all in irrigation management. I have a terrible dandelion problem. I had six dandelions last, last year. <laughs> and they were dug out. Yeah, old lawn that's thin, you've got to thicken it up. And the big thing on that would be, again, fall fertilization is the biggest secret and your aeration. And when you aerate, it's not, a single, it's not a single pass for the aerator. You want to make enough passes, your plugs are at two inches so that you really do increase the oxygen level of the soil. Yeah, you got, you got a big tree? Well, I'm a tree lover. 
because of the environmental benefits. Uh, the, trees, the street trees in Fort Collins bring in 2.2 million a year in the environmental benefits, so I'm big on trees. And I'll do everything I can to keep that tree healthy, so I'm not in there digging in the soil, messing with the tree. You can go onto my website and get it, and there's information about what is the tree protection zone, and I'm gonna really honor that. And so aeration of the lawn is probably more important for aeration for, for the tree, uh, but I'm going to have to adjust my landscaping to honor that tree protection zone. And, and shading, um, new research out, you know, we used to say, well, you, you thin a tree so plants will take the shade. Doesn't work that way. When we actually started measuring the shade, if you've got a tree that is shading plants out, put shade plants in. There's no alternative. Oh, that, that's a great question. The question was, when you have different zones, how do you irrigate them different? It's basically each zone is a different irrigation, or each area is a different irrigation zone. And you know, people say, well, I could take that dripper and I could put the two gallon dripper on the plant that needs more water and the half gallon on the plant that needs less. And it really doesn't work that way because the two gallon is gonna give you a bigger wet spot and the half gallon is gonna give you a smaller wet spot. And it doesn't mean that the root system is smaller and bigger. And it does, that doesn't take into account the different timing, the interval between irrigation. So you have different zones. I actually have three controllers in my garage. And I could have bought a more elaborate controller that could do multiple zones, but the cheap way was I have three, three different controllers to be able to accommodate all the different zones that are watered different than each other. So this would be a zone that's watered different than that zone. And I run my, my entire yard is, under, is on drip. Uh, and I like the, what's called drip line, which is the, the uh, quarter inch polytubing that has emitter every 12 inches. I've done that through the entire yard. It's all under mulch and I've absolutely loved the results of it. But I do have several different zones to accommodate my various hydrozones. My garden look like in the winter months? I, I generally leave the plants up in the winter because I like the, well, a lot were put in for that purpose. So it's, it's a dormant but it, it's there. I have a lot of dogwood, the red twig. I have a lot of yellow twig dogwood. I have a peach twig dogwood. Uh, I have some evergreens. It looks like a winter garden, but yeah, it's... It's the colors. It's the colors, and the big thing with winter garden, it's textures. And it's the big thing with the winter is, again, the plant next to the plant, different textures. But I have a lot of winter color, but the big thing is, is your texture are changing from plant to plant. Well, I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you very much. I think you've got some prizes or something.